Great. Welcome, everyone. I think this is a real uh, exciting um, uh, discussion today because we have a very critical moment to celebrate uh, for our patients with von Hippel-Lindau disease. Um, I'm here speaking from UT Southwestern. Um, again, my name is Hans Hammers, and um, my co-moderator is uh, Tony Chieri. Do you want to quickly introduce yourself? Yeah, Tony Chieri. Uh, medical oncologist at Dana Farber Cancer Institute in Boston, where the weather continues to be disappointing every day. Good. And then we have uh, Ram. You want to introduce yourself and Eric? Yeah. Uh, I'm Ram Srinivasan. I'm a medical oncologist at the National Cancer Institute. And I'm Eric Yonash, and I'm a medical oncologist at MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston. Wonderful, wonderful. So, um, so why don't we start with, you know, the very basic question, actually, for people who may not know so, well, so much about this disease, but what is von Hippel-Lindau disease? Uh, Ram, if you want to start with that, your institution has made major, major advances in that disease. So, uh, von Hippel-Lindau is an inherited uh, condition which predisposes uh, those affected uh, to develop a variety of different cancers, including cancers in the kidney, which is typically a clear cell kidney cancer. You can also develop cysts in the kidney. Uh, tumors in the pancreas, uh, the histology of the pancreatic tumors is typically something called a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor, although there are some cystadenomas and cysts that can also develop in the pancreas. People are also predisposed to developing pheochromocytomas, uh, uh, hemangioblastomas, which are very vascular tumors uh, that occur in the CNS, the brain, spine, uh, but also in the retina of the eyes. Uh, patients also have a tendency to develop, uh, you know, relatively rare tumors called endolymphatic sac tumors in the inner ears, uh, as well as uh, testicular uh, uh, you know, tumors and tumors in the broad ligament that are very similar to the tumors you see in the epididymis actually of the, of the, of the males. Um, this uh, is a condition that's been recognized for a very, very long time. Uh, but starting in the 80s, there was a concerted effort to try and understand the familial basis and the genetic basis of this disease, which culminated in the discovery in 1993 of a gene that was named the VHL gene, sits on chromosome 3. Uh, this discovery uh, was made by Marston Linehan at the National Cancer Institute and, and his colleagues. Uh, this was followed by uh, again, a very concerted uh, global effort to try and identify how alterations in the VHL gene that, that led to an activation of, of, of VHL uh, really led to kidney cancer and led to the seminal work that resulted in, uh, in the awarding of the Nobel Prize uh, to Bill Kale and, uh, and others, which really helped understand the role of hypoxia sensing in mediating cancer in the context of VHL loss. Uh, this then led to additional work that identified uh, one of the multiple hypoxia-inducible factors, HIF2, as being very critical in mediating renal oncogenesis uh, in the context of VHL loss. And this was done, this is work done in Bill Kalen's lab uh, in Boston, as well as Marston Lenahan's lab at, uh, at, the, at the National Cancer Institute. Uh, from there, we've had a series of interventions uh, trying to target the VHL pathway, most of, most of which have looked at downstream consequences of HIF activation, uh, including you know, agents targeting the vascular endothelial growth factor pathways. Uh, because for a long period, uh, HIF, uh, which we, many of us think HIF2 is very central to uh, the, the oncogenic process here, is considered undruggable because it's a transcription factors and traditionally transcription factors have been very, very difficult to drug. Uh, but due to, you know, outstanding work uh, done by uh, uh, scientists at UT Southwestern and uh, pharma collaborators, uh, uh, this myth was broken and uh, drugs, small molecule inhibitors for HIF2 were developed, uh, which led then to studies in both the VHL and ongoing studies in patients with paratic clear cell kidney cancer, uh, which as everybody knows now is, uh, has been the basis, uh, at least the VHL study has been the basis for a pool of uh, belzurifan in, in, in patients with VHL. So uh, overall, a very, very long and very, very satisfying story of uh, scientific and translational and clinical success uh, that you know, I'm very, very proud to have been a part of. Yeah, thank you so much, Ram. Yeah, it's, it's really fascinating. Um, 
you know, um, the um, HIF2 gene actually was discovered by Steve McKnight here at UD Southwestern. So again, a little bit institutional pride. And then as you said, you know, it's really difficult to target transcription factors and uh, was the so-called undruggable target. And then Kevin Gardner, Rick Bruick, they found this little hole in the what we call the past domain on HIF2. And um, they found a little molecule that fits in there. And then you get this reconfiguration and the transcription factors doesn't dimerize and doesn't go in the nuclear. So uh, really fantastic story. Good. Um, one more thing, um, you know, maybe um, Eric can speak about that a little bit. The phenotype of the VLHL patients, what's their age? Like what, you know, uh, what age group, so to say, are we looking at? What kind of patient group is it? And give a little bit more of like a clinical feeling what these patients had to endure until now, pro probably. Yeah, interesting question. You know, the manifestations can start in childhood. The retinal hemangioblastomas, the uh, pheochromocytomas can occur before the age of 10, even before the age of five in some individuals. The bulk of these lesions really start developing in the teens, in the 20s. And, and you see that uh, in terms of how the surveillance strategies are laid out, uh, they reflect this in terms of when the earliest imaging studies are. Just interesting in looking at the clinical trials and the clinical trials that we've done with other agents, as well as this particular study, we're talking about people in their late 30s, early 40s. Very good. And uh, and it, it really takes a team to take care of these patients, right? It's really a combination of surgeons, medical oncologists, neurosurgeons, um, ophthalmologists to really take care of these patients and, and often it culminates into these uh, Fonny Belinda centers of excellence really um, and certainly your two sites are uh, probably the nation's most prominent sites for Fonny Belinda patients. Now tell us about you know what was seen in the study that you two essentially led um, you know in Fonny Belinda patients um, the efficacy of this agent um, some of the side effects um, you know, like what is the tolerability and is this a drug that can be taken potentially for a long period of time? Yeah, great question. And, you know, just as a preamble, we've, we've uh, Demi Anderson and, and also NCI, other centers have tried using the anti-angiogenic agents in this patient population. And just sort of as an example, pazopinib and 31 patients in 2018. And what we saw there is we saw an objective response rate of over 50% in the kidney tumors, but we also saw significant side effects. You know, we see the, the hypertension, the nausea, the, uh, the diarrhea, the hair color changes that, that are associated with pazopinib really that, that made this a, a less than optimal agent. So what's so exciting about bilzutifan is that uh, it, it's oral. Uh, it's also very well tolerated. And um, from, an, from a toxicity perspective, the major toxicity that was seen was, was anemia. And this is an expected side effect because uh, erythropoietin is actually a HIF2-alpha target gene. And there was also a little bit of hypoxemia, meaning there was a little bit of a drop in the oxygen levels, but it was something that generally was reversible and very mild in this patient population and a bit of fatigue. So, so the side effect profile really, I think, matches what I would call sort of a well population. The efficacy data, you know, we, we're dealing with individuals who, as, as uh, Ram pointed out, have pleiotropic manifestations. And we then have to design a study that actually um, can, can be um, statistically significant, but also beneficial to the patients. And so the primary endpoint of the study was objective response rate in the kidney tumors. But we early on, you know, we're, we're all advocates for making sure that very careful collection of data on the central nervous system lesions, as well as the pancreatic lesions occurred as well, just in case we might actually get um, some, some approvals for those organ systems. There was a 49% objective response rate in, in, in kidney tumors. There was a 30% objective response rate in the hemangioblastomas. And depending on how you look at it, there was a greater than a 50% um, much greater than 50% objective response rate in the pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. And, and we all have seen that what happens with these patients is number one, um, they feel better uh, generally. And number two, we're seeing a slow but steady and, and um, persistent reduction in the size of the lesions throughout their bodies. So it's, it's really been a game changer in that regard. And it's been so exciting to see what the patients, you know, how the patients feel, how the scans look, um, the durability of this treatment. Outstanding. Ram, anything to add from your perspective? 
I, I think Eric, you know, summarized this beautifully. Uh, uh, and just as an aside, if any of you is wondering if my hair color changes are because of wedge of target agents, they're not. I mean, they just occurred with age more than anything else. Uh, but to go back to you know, a very, very important point that Eric made, uh, and that is uh, we've all looked at studies, uh, we, we've all looked at agents that target the VEGF pathway uh, in patients with VHR, uh, essentially using a design that is somewhat similar to the one that we adapted for the Belzer Defense study. Uh, Eric mentioned the Pazopanib study, uh, and we conducted a 37 uh, patient study with, uh, with a dual VEGF or EGFR and a bit of Vendetinib. And again, uh, so the results are very similar to what Eric had, which was uh, we saw some you know, responses in the renal tumors. Uh, we didn't see a whole lot happening in the CNS tumors, eyes, or pancreatic tumors, uh, which I think is an important point uh, to note here. And, and tolerability was a big, big issue. I mean, uh, we should remember that traditionally these patients are managed surgically. So they have a very reasonable, viable surgical option. And any treatment that I think we provide should be at least as good as surgery uh, and hopefully better in, in, in some ways, at least in terms of side effects and so on and so forth. Uh, and that uh, the VEGF targeted agents were unable to, to deliver on. On, on the Vendetinib study, for instance, the median time on study for these patients was less than six months. They just found the drug very hard to, you know, to deal with. Uh, now, this is very different. You give the same drug to patients with metastatic kidney cancer, it's a different story. They tend to tolerate this better. They don't have generally other options that they can fall back on. So uh, the tolerability issues in the VHA patient populations, a very special population, are very, very different. And I think anything we do in the field has got to be very cognizant of, of that. And I think Belzutifan uh, has, has really, I think, helped us overcome those limitations that we saw with the wedge of targeted agents. We've had patients on for more than two years, uh, and the vast majority of patients who started the study remained on study at the time of our last uh, last analysis. In terms of efficacy, as Eric pointed out, we are seeing things that we were not seeing, uh, uh, at least to the same extent with wedge of targeted agents, and that is responses in the pancreas, responses in the, in the CNS tumors. Uh, and as we reported in, in some of our uh, you know, meeting abstracts and so on and so forth, and hopefully in our publication to come forth, we were also seeing changes in the retinal angiomas or retinal hemangioblastomas. So uh, I think all in all, uh, in a, a, a big, big step forward for VHM patients. Yeah. And then, you know, if you look at the, this, you know, what we call the, you know, the, the, um, um, if you look at the tumor size shrinkage, actually, you know, we always call it 49% response rate, but if you look at any shrinkage, I mean, this waterfall plot, as we call it, right, is actually quite impressive because it's almost everybody who seems to have some kind of benefit, which leads me a little bit to the next question. Maybe then we can also segue into, what this what role this drug may play in actually sporadic kidney cancer but the response rate is is clearly is very high it seems to be higher than what we see in sporadic kidney cancer so um, maybe you can comment on that why that might be and also you know do you think the efficacy is high enough that we may not need a biomarker in this patient population what are your thoughts so the the question of of a uh biomarker, first of all, I think in the von Hippel-Lindau disease patient population, the biomarker really is the germline genetic defect, and we do want to see that. The next question is whether or not there's variabilities in that genetic defect from a response perspective, and I don't, I don't know if we have an answer for that yet, but that's, I think, a critical thing, and of course, then resistance and acquired resistance or upfront resistance, which is much less of a problem, um, are, are, are next important questions. But to your point, uh, Hans, the, the, almost everyone had some degree of shrinkage. And this is the amazing thing about this. And if you look at the number of individuals who've actually come off study for progression, it's, it's a small, small number, even with median follow-up of two years. And so from that standpoint, you know, we're seeing different kinetics. We're seeing that this is a, a therapy that continues to provide benefits. So far, we've not really started to see this acquisition of, of resistance phenotypes. It's unquestionable we're going to see that in the future and what we have to be ready for is to be to be able to understand why that happens right yeah tony um so you are you are one of the leaders in developing new therapies in kidney cancer obviously for sporadic kidney cancer uh, this drug will play a major role there are phase three trials ongoing like like where do you see the development for this drug 
single agent versus combinations, et cetera. Um, what are your thoughts? No, it, it's a beautiful story. Let me just take you back. How beautiful is it? Not just from a biology in a standpoint culminating in a Nobel Prize in 2019, because really this whole pathway, the VHL, you know, HIF pathway has implications uh, beyond cancer and beyond kidney cancer. I mean, with anemia, with heart disease, et cetera. So it wasn't really surprising to get it, you know, to, to get this work, um, you know, on the highest stage ever for, for science and medicine. But even for clinical trial, this is beautiful. My colleagues here remember even the first compound that you talked about, Hans, um, you know, targeting the past B domain, PT2385, uh, where initially when we worked uh, with UT Southwestern on on that study in sporadic uh, clear cell RCC, um, we did not have a dose limiting toxicity. So this is different than chemotherapy, then VEGF TKI, et cetera, et cetera. So what we went with a pharmacodynamic uh, marker, which was what Eric uh, mentioned, uh, EPO level, since this is downstream of uh, uh, HIF2. And, um, you know, another roadblock was the fact that despite single agent activity for the first compound in a heavily refractory uh, population, uh, that activity was 14%, one four response rate. That's not something that uh, made us a lot, uh, you know, uh, happy initially, but it was explained immediately by the fact that that particular drug or molecule, PT2385, might not have the best pharmacokinetic uh, properties. Actually, if you look at the exposure, greater exposure, you know, is associated with a longer PFS. And that led to the compound now approved for VHL-associated malignancies and and trials are ongoing in uh, metastatic sporadic clear cell RCC. The second compound, which is PT2977 or MK6482, or now has a name, Belzutifan. Uh, and, and what the change was between the 2385 and the 2977 um, you know, structure in terms of uh, uh, chemistry uh, the, the geminal uh, defluoro group in the parental compound was replaced by a cis vicinal uh, group. And, and all what did this, although this is maybe a small modification, it led to less binding to serum protein and greater exposure. And at the same time, the affinity to the past B domain that you talked about was, uh, became, uh, became higher. And I think one of the other properties, et cetera, is um, the low susceptibility of the newer uh, compound, the 2977, to glucorinidation, which is really the main way that this drug uh, get, um, you know, um, in a way uh, uh, excreted or at least metabolized, I would say. So now in a similar trial, of highly refractory clear cell RCC population, the response rate went up to 25%. Uh, and that led to a phase three trial that is still ongoing in patients whose tumor progressed after checkpoint inhibitor, after VEGF TKI uh, versus an mTOR inhibitor. Uh, that's trial called OO5. And at the same time, um, you know, everybody knows here that this drug is being combined in multiple trials that are just starting, uh, whether in the front line, a second line, uh, you know, in the front line, for example, the drug is being combined since it's quite tolerated. These are not VEGF TKI toxicity. There is no whitening of the hair like Dr. Srinivasan or... Uh, fall of the hair like Dr. Jonas. Thankfully, I don't have that problem. That we have neither of those I, problems. Yeah, they don't have. They have many, but I don't have that problem. So uh, we don't have, we have anemia, which is easily manageable in a way. And the hypoxia that Eric uh, talked about, which I would say that that's something we have to keep an eye on. I'm quite confident that Eric and Ram on their VHL study didn't see much hypoxia. Probably these patients do have, there was one case, normal lung, et cetera. 
while in the metastatic studies, we saw up to 18% significant hypoxia. And we don't know why, but, but HIF2, like VEGF anyway, and other molecule, uh, is not all bad. And they have some role, physiologic role, in the carotid body, in the pulmonary uh, vasculature, so that when you inhibit that, you have a VQ mismatch. Now, you have lungs that are already have a lot of metastases, prior surgery, pleural effusion, PE. You live in Machu Picchu, where you're really hanging by a thread here. Then you decompensate. And that's why probably these healthier, in a way, lung-wise, younger patient with VHL syndrome did not have much hypoxia, something we have to keep uh, an eye on. So a lot of studies, we have a frontline triplet study. So that one of the advantage of that HIF2 inhibitor, like, you know, it doesn't have immune-related AEs. It doesn't have the same toxicity as VEGF TKI. So that means just common sense, it can be combined. So it being combined with VEGF inhibitor, with immune checkpoint inhibitor, you know, and, you know, it's going to be taken to the next level. And the one thing I want to add, and everyone is aware of that, that once you launch a field, imagine when sorafenib a long time ago, you know, started in renal cell cancer. It launched a complete field of even me too drugs. And yes, you want drugs that are improved, but drugs that could even be better. So there are other um, now uh, companies interested to focus completely on HIF2. And I think only good thing will happen to find an ideal compound you know, with time. So that's my, my two cents and uh, very humble to be part of this journey that I would think is just starting clinically. Outstanding. I think uh, this was a fantastic discussion. Um, I really want to congratulate Eric and Ram for the fantastic work and the difference uh, you guys made with your hard work for VHL patients. And certainly thank you so much for your time. Um, and um, have a great day. Thank you so much. Thanks, Hans. Thanks, Thank Jerry. Thanks, Thanks Ron. Thanks, Jerry. See you guys.